Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here, whether you're in person or are uh, part of our webcasting audience. I'm Michael Pahn. I'm the head of Archives and Collections Digitization here at the National Museum of the American Indian. And I'm also vice chair of the Smithsonian Music Executive Committee. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this discussion today about the education and careers of Native American musicians in the early 20th century. Marching bands were an important part of Native American boarding schools didactic model. Boarding schools were part of the federal government's attempt at forced assimilation of Native Americans by forcibly removing children from their communities and ruthlessly punishing them for exercising aspects of their cult traditional culture, including their language and religious practices. So for me, the story of Native American musicians coming out of boarding schools is a testament to both the resiliency of indigenous people and cultures and the power of music as a positive force in people's lives. So before we get started, a few housekeeping items. First of all, please silence your cell phones. I know you think you already did, but just check again. Um, if you don't already, please consider following uh, the National Museum of the American Indian on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And I'd also like to express my deep gratitude to the Smithsonian Year of Music for providing support for this program. So now, let's get down to business. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. John Troutman is a curator in the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History's Division of Culture and Community Life. John earned his master's degree at, in American Indian Studies at the University of Arizona and his PhD in History at the University of Texas at Austin. He is the author of numerous articles and two award-winning books, including Kikakila, How the Hawaiian Steel Guitar Changed the Sound of Modern Music, and Indian Blues, American Indians, and the Politics of Music from 1879 to 1934. John is also a member of the Smithsonian Music Executive Committee. Aaron Furr is the archivist at the Sequoia National Research Center at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock, a position she's held since 2011. Aaron has her bachelor's degree in music from Central Baptist College and her master's degree in musicology and a master's degree in library science and information, I'm sorry, library and information studies from the University of Oklahoma. Erin is Yupik and is a descendant of the Cook Inlet region in incorporated share of a Cook region inlet. Re oh my God, I apologize. Cook Inlet region incorporated shareholder. Her research interests include the music education and performance of Native Americans during and after the boarding school era and the history of American Indian marching bands. And with that, I'll introduce John Troutman. Hi, thank you so much um, and welcome to this beautiful theater. Um, I, I want to thank um, Michael uh, for inviting me, and I'm so excited to be on a sharing this moment with Aaron as well. I'm really excited to hear what she has to say and show us. Um, and I want to thank um, Hayes and Lucky and the staff for facilitating this event as well. Can you hear me okay? You need some more volume? All right, hold on. Let me see what I can How's this? All right. So I want to thank everybody that made this possible um, for us. And um, it's also kind of fun for me to, to participate in this event because um, well, for one thing, because I'm going to speak a little bit about the, the research that I conducted as I was writing my dissertation 20 years ago. Um, but also, I was, I was involved a little bit in, the, in, in this film. I was interviewed for the film, and I shared some, um, some research with the filmmaker Kathleen O'Connell as well. But um, I remember this is the first time that I was ever on camera. It was about 15 years ago, and it was absolutely terrifying. And I think she had to cut... I mean, everything, I mean, I basically just sent her an email afterward and just said, I'm so sorry <laughs> that I was so nervous. But um, she seemed to, you know, cut out all the, the really kind of nervous, you know, energy that I was expressing during the interview. So it'll be interesting to see this again. I haven't seen it in quite a while. Um, <clears throat> I was asked just to kind of provide us with a little bit of context in terms of thinking about this um, marching band tradition in Native communities. And... Um, I thought that in order to do so, and to kind of set up what Aaron's going to talk about afterward, um, I'd provide more of kind of an overview of the, the entire um, economy of musical practice that um, Native people were engaging in in the late 19th and early 20th centuries when uh, marching bands really came to the fore in their communities and in the boarding schools. 
And in fact, it's, it's important to take note that um, marching bands were really the pop music uh, in much of North America that arose in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, and that that was experienced by everyone who were in communities in North America at the time. Um, but there are also some really important fundamental differences in the, the ways in which the tradition of, of music making with these instruments arose um, for many um, native communities on the continent. So I'm going to speak a little bit about some of those differences and again provide a bit of an overview. Um, now I should say in terms of context, um, my context coming to that original research project was really steeped um, actually and admittedly in my fondness for country music. Um, this was again about 20 years ago when I began this project and um, I was accustomed to flipping through records and, um, and record stores and looking for you know old cheap used copies of country music on vinyl and I would continuously kind of encounter images like this this is the cover of one of Loretta Lynn's um, albums uh, or you could find sheet music like Hank Williams and you know I began to see more and more of this, and I, and I began to kind of wonder why. And at the time, I was enrolled in the American Indian Studies program there, and I began speaking with some of the, the faculty about it and learning more about it. Um, and they encouraged me to keep exploring and to think about, you know, these representations of Native people in popular music. So in 1998, I received a, a fellowship to come to the Smithsonian, specifically to work in the American History Museum in order to see what I could find about um, these sorts of musical representations. And there I found actually hundreds of pieces of sheet music that also featured a lot of this sort of um, imagery and iconography that in fact um, would be very familiar to you specifically if you've already seen the magnificent show upstairs, The Americans. And you know, there was enough sheet music filling the archive in American history like this that you could plaster along all of the walls of that main gallery space in the Americans. I mean, it was really kind of stunning. But um, as I continued that work, and as I also began to work in the National Archives, where the archives for the Office of Indian Affairs are housed, then I also began to see a very different story emerging and a much more interesting story for me, which was the fact that I began to encounter images, um, sheet music, photographs on sheet music, um, postcards that featured, in fact, um, American Indian bands incorporating these same instruments that were becoming so incredibly popular in the late 19th and early 20th centuries in the United States. And this is where, and this is something that I was not familiar with as a historian, it was something that was very interesting to me, however, and that's really what set me on the road to learning more about the history, kind of the early history of these bands. Um, so like I said, there are some similarities in the ways in which everyone on the continent began to experience and find joy in marching bands, um, marching through their towns on Saturday afternoons um, or in pavilions on Sunday afternoons. Um, but there are also fundamental differences. And one of the most important things I think that we need to remain cognizant of in terms of native music making in the late 19th century is that it was actually dangerous for native people to practice music. And by practice music, I mean music and dance. Um, because people were getting hurt as a consequence of it. I'm sure that most everyone here is familiar with um, what occurred at Pine Ridge in December of 1890 when over 200 Minakanju and Hunkpapa Lakotas were killed by members of the 7th Cavalry for being associated with the ghost dance tradition. But in fact, there are many different manners by which members of Native communities throughout the continent were impacted and coerced as a result of music making as a result of dancing. And so this is a really um, important period for us to think about as we begin to understand the emergence of these bands. So we see this kind of dangerous time, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, um, for Native peoples um, and Native music makers. But this is also a time in which, of course, everyone is finding and continues to find community and cultural vitality and pride in their music making. And music making for Native people with these sorts of instrumentations um, and this sorts of music was no exception to that rule. So in the late 19th century, the marching band tradition began um, at, a, at a moment in which, and Michael kind of began to, to suggest this in the introduction, at a moment in which uh, the federal Indian government, the federal government was, introdu was introducing new strategies for essentially removing Native peoples from their remaining lands and from detribalizing 
them as well. Um, this kind of happened through a major kind of two-pronged strategy, the one being allotment, whereby the remaining reservation lands in the U.S. were parceled up and cut up into small parcels that were designated for individuals or nuclear families. Um, and then the, the remaining lands, which the government called surplus lands, would then be distributed and sold to non-native um, farmers and others on reservations throughout the country. Um, but during that process, the U.S. government had determined that it would begin to bestow U.S. citizenship upon the native peoples receiving these allotments, whether or not they wanted that citizenship or not. But what begins to change is that over that time, from the 1880s into the 1920s, fewer and fewer native people are granted citizenship, U.S. citizenship, um, as the U.S. government had begun to determine that they were not competent to manage their own affairs during that period. And the U.S. government began to imagine U.S. citizenship for Native people, not in terms of their rights, but in terms of their responsibilities and their duties to conform to a particular idea of Americanness. The requirements for the citizenship included and involved the dissolution of tribal knowledge and traditions, including Native musical practices. And in fact, this is what was also really stunning for me as I began to, to look at the National Archives down the mall. Um, the federal government became obsessed with music. They became, uh, federal administrators of the Office of Indian Affairs became absolutely obsessed with the musical practice of, practices of peoples and communities throughout the United States. And I say obsessed because um, if you go there and look in the documents, you'll find thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of pages of documents that are essentially surveillance reports of families um, and societies and other groups within these reservation communities that were dancing. And so music was taken very seriously by the federal government at this time, um, as seriously as everyone else on these reservations was taking it as well, because music became, in fact, um, quite a powerful source of resistance to these policies as well, which I'll talk about in a second. But it's challenging at this moment when marching bands become increasingly popular in the United States that at the same time Native people are being arrested for dancing on the reservations, practicing their own um, musical traditions, uh, as well as being, um, having their rations withheld from them during this period as well if they're dancing. So there's all kinds of really um, remarkable reports that are feeding into D.C. from reservations all over the country about this very practice. But music, I would imagine, is, a, is so important to all of us um, internally and emotionally, and that certainly um, has that's been the case for everyone across time that we're aware of. Music is such kind of a universal um, love for all of us. And of course, then, what's also really interesting is that at this moment, um, Native peoples began to develop some really particular and specific strategies for pushing back against these restrictions um, and these efforts by the federal government to really strip um, peoples of their traditions. So it's at this time in the late 18, 19th and early 20th centuries, for example, when um, superintendents on reservations receive across their desk on a constant basis throughout the, the, really throughout North America, request for people to, for example, hold dances on the 4th of July, or on Washington's birthday, or Lincoln's birthday, or Christmas, or Thanksgiving, or before Lent, or after Lent, or on New Year's. Community members began finding all sorts of ways to strategize, to really mandate that reservation officials enable them, give them the right to dance as they would see fit. At the same time, in the 1915, 16, and 17, Native people were volunteering for service um, to fight in World War I at a rate higher than any other group in the country. Um, so their communities began to request to reservation agents that they be entitled to dance in order to honor their returning soldiers, their veterans, or in order to hold giveaways to raise money for the Red Cross. And so we, we see very quickly that just as much as um, officials within the federal government are expressing anxiety about music and about dance on reservations, in fact, um, theirs is a losing gambit because if anything, musical practice continues to expand within these communities. <laughs> 
The Office of Indian Affairs, however, felt that it would have had even, uh, that it would have better success perhaps to control musical practice in the schools, in the federal Indian boarding schools and other um, religious schools, missionary schools that um, Michael had uh, mentioned earlier. Um, in this part, the second prong strategy for the federal government, that of assimilation, the idea was that children um, placed in these schools, um, coercively taken into the schools on many occasions, would be essentially stripped of their own systems of knowledge, tribal knowledge um, and traditions, and that they would be kind of immersed in uh, essentially a, um, a scheme of Americanness that would come with very specific musical practices as well, including performances in marching bands. And that's what brings us to really um, the subject of, of the remainder of our, our um, program today. In the schools, and I'll move I'll, in the schools, and I'll move through this quickly. Um, children, this is a music classroom at Carlisle uh, Indian School, actually. Um, children were taught very specific songs, very specific forms of music that were associated with what the government imagined as this assimilative um, process and strategy um, for the children. And so, at Carlisle, for example, 29 times per day, um, children marched through the grounds. They woke. They um, they ate, they worked, they attended classes, they studied, they went to sleep through kind of the cadences of bugle calls and musical performances by the kids' bands on the campuses. James Garvey, who's the Santee Sioux assistant bandmaster at Carlisle, remembered at this time in the early 19-teens, quote, one hour before breakfast, we'd go out and drill. I would stand over there and blow reveille in the morning to wake them up and blow taps at night for the lights to go out. Strictly military. Oh, God, we might as well be at West Point. And the kids, you know, the kids were all wearing uh, surplus military uniforms at the schools as well. So it really was, the marching bands really began int getting introduced to children, especially to boys um, in these schools, as a means to regiment, to discipline um, their bodies. Um, and so these bands became um, part of this strategy by the government to assimilate the children and to a different kind of understanding of what Americanness should mean. Um, and we also see this, the formation of particular types of string bands. This is from Carlisle. You can see a quintet here. And these were all musical practices that, uh, you know, the government had approved of and seemed um, relevant to their assimilation campaign. But what they didn't count on, perhaps, was the fact that the kids, in many cases, loved the music. Um, and of course, they didn't see any challenge to reconciling um, their own sense of themselves and their responsibilities and their roles in their communities, um, their tribal identities, with um, their interest in pop music. Um, in the latest two steps, and um, all of the music that kind of fed out of these marching band traditions that were becoming so incredibly popular in North America at this time. And so what we really begin to see happening in consequence um, during the early 20th century is that as more and more children are handed these instruments, which are often actually surplus instruments from the U.S. Civil War, as more and more horns were produced um, for regiments um, during that period, as more and more people gained access to these instruments, they began, rather than using them as tools in order to serve the interest of the administrators of the schools, manners in which they can articulate and express themselves for who they are. And so uh, whether it's through these uh, uh, bands that were in Indian boarding schools, um, or whether it's through professional bands that then organized after people left the schools um, to travel the world, they began incorporating all these instruments into their own vital musical expressions. This is a group, uh, Joe, Joe Shinatona's group actually, that um, was performing in Paris at the time. And this um, all Indian jazz band, that's essentially how they would kind of market themselves. And what's also really kind of brilliant about this is that as the government continued to kind of develop this assimilation campaign, in fact, they were overwhelmed, outmatched from the very beginning because of the expressive ways in which um, individuals took these new technologies, took these new tools, 
retained them along with all of the longstanding traditions that they'd always been fond of and interested in, but then broke them out into new ground, actually celebrating and elevating um, their own identities as tribal peoples on public stages, on platforms, at a time when that was not really um, provided as any sort of option for them otherwise. So the economy of music making um, that we see unfolding in the early 20th century begins to um, lend itself not only to the eventual um, complete uh, uh, shutdown of the allotment and assimilation policies by the late 1920s, but it also began to present itself as uh, new lines for expression for Native peoples who began to embrace these musical technologies and do all sorts of amazing things with them. So I'm just going to stop right there, Aaron, and let you, let you pick up the story. Thank you. I thoroughly enjoyed listening to what you had to say, John. I figured you would probably do a, a good job of giving the context so that I didn't have to um, do very much of that. I first want to start off by saying thank you to the museum and for Michael Pond for arranging this, inviting me to come. Um, I have done a lot of research on this topic, but I haven't published, so it was a little intimidating to be on the same program as John, who has published a book on it, and you'll later see him on screen. Um, but I do um, want to kind of explore the individuals that were involved in this um, taking back of identity by Native peoples um, that were kind of stripped from the, during the boarding school era. Standing Rock poet Tiffany Midge wrote a poem entitled, What is the Sound of America? In it, she traces the history of some of the Native musicians and bands, in particular focusing on the Nez Perce jazz bands, which were quite prolific during this um, early 20th century time period. She embraces the idea that America is made of distinct individual sounds that include, quote, the sound of wind whistling through the Snake River Canyon, the sound of a stomp dance, bells and seeds, the sound of Indians playing jazz. So in order to understand how Native musicians make up the sounds of America, Boarding schools are where we have to start because the majority of musicians during this time period were educated in that boarding school environment and their traditional music was replaced by Western mainstream music and musical instruments like John um, demonstrated. Here we see um, the Tulalip Indian Band from Washington State. And then in addition to the bands that were prolific at boarding schools, they would also create these smaller ensembles like this trombone choir from Carlisle. Many um, American Indians excelled in music because they had this background of music being part of their culture. And so after they left the boarding schools, they continued performing, teaching, and even establishing their own musical ensembles and bands during this period. There was a plethora of Native musicians in the first half of the 20th century, including this brass band from Metlakatla, Alaska, and then the Meskwaki Band, which was from the state of Iowa. Some of the more well-known musicians, uh, Native musicians of this time period, have received quite a bit of scholarly attention. Um, for instance, Fred Cardin was a Quapaw violinist. Um, Chinese a Redfeather Blackstone was a Creek and Cherokee singer. Um, and she was very well known because of her connection and collaboration with the indigenous composer Charles Cadman. Tayata was a Chickasaw singer and actress, and the Chickasaw Nation just a couple of years ago re uh, released a feature film on her life, which was really interesting. But if you look at what has been produced in the realm of scholarly publications, um, that's just a very small window into the number of musicians that were around during that time period and the number of bands. 
So this afternoon, I want to introduce you to some of those lesser known musicians. The first one is Albert Manus Screamer, who is Eastern Band Cherokee. Um, he was a student of Carlisle, and while he was there, he was a talented tenor, clarinetist, and oboist. And I just love this photograph of him. It's clearly staged, but it gives you this illusion that you, the photographer interrupted him in the middle of a practice session. Um, he, while he was at Carlisle, he was in the band, um, and then afterwards, he toured throughout the state of North Carolina as a vocalist, performing mostly at churches in the region. In 1911, he established Screamers Orchestra, and um, I haven't been able to find very much information about who was involved in that or where they played, but it's a great name for, a, for an ensemble. In 1916, he joined the first infantry band in Asheville, North Carolina, and was part of um, the, as a military musician. And while I haven't been able to determine if he was involved in World War I, it is very possible since America entered the war in 1917. There were 12,000 American Indians that served in the First World War, and a lot of them did serve as military musicians. Rollo Jackson is another musician, and he made a military his career. In 1904, he joined the 7th Cavalry Band and toured the world along with other Carlisle students. Um, he was Seneca from upstate New York. And he, in this letter to Wallace Denny, who was the superintendent of Carlisle at the time, um, he wrote in 1915 that he decided this is what he's going to do for the rest of his life so he can draw a pension. So that's exactly what he did. Um, he, however, made the unusual decision to switch from the Army to the Coast Guard. And in 1924, he became the bandmaster at the Coast Guard Academy in New London, Connecticut. Um, when he retired in 1938, he, had, uh, he was the chief petty, uh, chief petty officer rank and had been in the military for over 30 years. What's interesting, though, is that not only did he go to work every day and he performed or directed musicians, he was also involved on his own um, in the communities where he was located. Um, whenever he was at Fort Riley, Kansas, he played in the Junction City Band and played both the B-flat bass horn and trombone. And then when he was in Connecticut, he played as part of their symphony orchestra where he played tuba. So where did these musicians perform? Many of them performed on the Chautauqua circuits and Lyceum circuits that were very popular during the 19th and early part of the 20th century. They were um, adult education movements that were designed to bring educational, spiritual, and cultural experiences to small rural cities and towns across the United States. And so Indian bands and musicians were very popular at that time. And so the newspapers, whenever they would come through, liked to hype their performances and many times use this stereotypical language and imagery to get a crowd. However, their tunes changed once they heard them and they realized that they actually could play. They were real musicians. David Russell Hill's band, um, or orchestra, the Iroquois Indian Orchestra, um, in 1912 performed in New York and the newspapers said, quote, both the musical journals and the critics agreed that the programs of the Indian artists were equal to the best work of similar organizations known to the music-loving cities of Europe. Well, what's interestingly, interesting enough is that two years prior, David Russell Hill and his um, group, the American Indian Concert Band, had just come back from a tour of Germany and Austria. And so, yes, they were right up there with the European groups. Um, he was Onondaga, and he was a graduate of Hampton Institute which was another boarding school, but it was unusual because it began as an educational institute for African-American students, and then they incorporated American Indian and even Puerto Rican students. He also, um, he, 
he was a director of several um, bands that traveled throughout the U.S., the two that I mentioned, and then also the Onondaga Concert Band as well. After a performance by James Riley Wheelock's band in Leavenworth, Kansas, the local newspaper um, said that, I know that y'all came out to see a real live band of Indians to perform, and um, in fact, you didn't think that they were going to be able to perform anything at all. But, but the crowd was doomed to a great awakening, for the Indians under the leadership of James Riley Wheelock composed one of the finest musical organizations ever heard in Leavenworth. So they realized that, yes, they were Indians, but they could play, and it, they didn't have to rely on that um, curiosity factor to get a crowd. So I want to tell you a little bit more about James Riley Wheelock. His brother, Dennison, gets most of the credit, and um, there was actually a photograph of Dennison earlier in John's presentation. But James was also um, a bandmaster. He graduated from Carlisle as well in 1896, and then um, he, he played the clarinet, but he was also an excellent bandmaster, and he made his career doing that. In 1902, after his brother Dennison had moved on, James took over um, as bandmaster for Carlisle. And then in 1903, the Department of the Interior sent James to study music in Leipzig, Germany for the summer. He stayed at Carlisle for another year, and then he resigned to play solo clarinet for his brother's band at Haskell in Lawrence, Kansas. And then in 1905, he decided, well, I can do this. So he created his own band, and for the next five years, the Willocks United States Indian Band toured the East Coast on different lyceum circuits at that time. They were billed as the only Indian band in the United States and the only professional Indian organization of this kind in the world. That wasn't true, but that's what they wanted people to believe. Um, but Wheelock was very highly regarded um, by critics and newspapers alike. He was often described as young and dignified with a chivalrous style, a man of culture and refinement and of marvelous musical attainments. He also earned the nickname of the Red Rival of Susa or the Red Susa, and this um, stayed with him for the rest of his career. When James was gathering up musicians for his bands, many times he pulled from former Carlisle students. Um, one was George Willard, who was Alaska Native from Sitka, Alaska. And in a survey that Carlisle sent out, which they did regularly, wanting to make sure that what they did took and they were um, still um, assimilated and away from their um, Native cultures, George says that he has been involved with lots of different musical organizations and he's been able to travel the world and see the real beauty of the country. In this, and he included this photo with his survey, and I think it's really nice because he's got his Wheelock uniform on. But in addition to that, he also played with David Russell Hill, and he was part of that group that went to Germany and Austria in 1910. So there were lots of these musicians that moved from group to group depending on circumstances and geographic location. It just varied. So while Wheelock expected musical excellence from his bands, he would play up the expectations of the crowd, often donning beadwork, buckskin, and feathers, and even playing some Indian melodies that were composed by him or his brother that were considered rare and thrilling. Um, while this was enough to make um, the concert goers interested, they left feeling that they had really um, listened to a great band play. These photographs were actually taken whenever James Riley Willock's band was at the Cincinnati Zoo Gardens in 1929, and this was an engagement that he held for at least three different summers where they would come and play for a few weeks at a time at the zoo. Wheelock um, decided to do away with his band in 1910 and take some more commercial and community directorships. So he um, 
directed the Enola Pennsylvania Railroad YMCA Band, the Bethlehem Steel Company Band, and even the Hagerstown, Maryland Municipal Band. But he couldn't stay away long from his Indian musicians and eventually went to Sherman Institute at Riverside, California to teach before coming back to Carlisle. Willock was adamant that his musicians be treated like the true musicians that they were. And I'm sure most of you have heard Richard Henry Pratt's motto of kill the Indian, save the man. And Willock wanted his band to prove that that was not um, true. So in 1917, he says, quote, anyone who has ever who has ever heard the Wheelock's United States Indian Band play will testify that I have brought before the public a strong contradiction to that old saying that the only good Indian is a dead one and prove that an Indian with proper training is capable of mastering the highest art music. I have also included um, a sample of the program that his band played while they were at Carnegie Hall in New York. Um, they regularly played classical selections from Wagner to Paderewski and even Sousa, and the Star Spangled Banner was a popular program ending to their show. He truly believed that race did not matter and it didn't influence a person's musical ability at all. And this was very evident whenever World War I came around and he became the second lieutenant of the 808th Pioneer Infantry Band which was an all-black regimental band. As far as I know, he is the only American Indian to hold this distinction um, as a band director during World War I. His band was highly regarded, and they won the best infantry band in the American in Expeditionary Forces, and they even had the privilege to perform for President Woodrow Wilson in 1919 in France, right before he came back to the United States. After the war, Willock went back to what he had been doing, and he became the band director at the Genoa Indian School in Nebraska. I think he directed at most of the Indian schools <laughs> in the U.S. at that time. Um, the remainder of his career saw him um, come back um, with a revival of the Wheelock Band. He directed a band at, on the Steel Pier in Atlantic City, and he died in 1941 after a long and successful career as a band director. The last musician that I want to talk about today is Jacob C. Morgan. He was a Navajo cornetist and violinist. He also attended Hampton, and in this photograph, he is pictured in 1898 with the Wigwam Orchestra that was at the school. After graduation, he went back to the Navajo Reservation, um, but in 1903, he had the opportunity to travel with the Haskell Institute in Indian Band for five weeks while they toured um, through Colorado. This was under the leadership of Denison Wheelock, James's brother, and it is reported that over one million people heard the band on these tours. I don't know if that's true or not, but I'll take it. That's, oh, there were a lot of people. Um, the Daily Republican from the Denver, Colorado newspaper reported that what they heard was beyond all expectations and why it's better than the professionals do. <laughs> In 1904, he was chosen to play with the government official Indian band at the 1904 World's Fair that was held in St. Louis. Um, this was also known as the Louisiana Purchase Expo Exposition. There were about 40 members in this band, and it was touted as a band that has never been excelled. They were in residence throughout the summer, and they played two concerts a day, and after the World's Fair was over that summer, they toured the Midwest for the fall under the Central Lyceum Bureau management. They played a mixture of classical, Indian, and religious selections um, as evidence from a program from that time period where the William Tell Overture was right next to the Indian War Dance, and um, Morgan often played the cornet solo titled Holy City by Stephen Adams. After the World's Fair was over, he went back to the Navajo Reservation and ended up teaching band and teaching music in several of the schools located in that area. 
They were well regarded and they performed at lots of community events and they even performed at the 1924 dedication of the Mesa Verde Park. Um, he often played cornet solos for different uh, events, including a Pueblo Benito 4th of July celebration in 1914. In 1925, he left the Indian service and he dedicated his life to ministry. And in 1944, he became the first ordained Navajo Methodist preacher. But he also in, was, got involved in Navajo politics and in 1938 became tribal chairman for the nation. Which brings me to the Navajo Nation band. Um, the Jacob C. Morgan and two of his band, two of his sons, Irwin and Wilbur, helped to start this band and it's very I have yet to be able to find a definitive answer on when this actually began um, it was sometimes in the 20s and 30s um, and they also played with Arthur Hubbard who became an Arizona state senator Howard Gorman who was vice chairman of the Navajo Nation while Jacob Morgan was chairman and then Woodrow Nelson also played it started out as a way for these former boarding school musicians to continue this practice because they had fallen in love with this music. But it eventually became a way to serve as ambassadors to the world on behalf of the Navajo Nation. They, they still exist today and are very active and they have played in three presidential inaugurations including JFK's, Nixon's, and Obama's in 2013. There are too many musicians to cover in this short amount of time but hopefully if I, I've introduced you to just a few of those. They were able to take Western instruments that were forced on them and make them their own by creating successful professional careers. Although Native musicians started out as curiosities, they performed on stages from the rural town hall to the best concert halls in the U.S. and Europe. They shared their talents and love of music, eventually earning respect as true musicians, becoming the sounds of America. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aaron and John. Um, we're about to show Susa on the Res, which is about a half an hour long. We're not going to have a formal question and answer session, but um, We'll probably stick around for a few minutes after the film, so if you would like to uh, speak to Aaron or John or um, learn more about this subject, um, feel free to, to stick around. And thank you all for coming. <laughs>